You are now listening to Durian Asia, the voice of discovery and sharing. Monday morning matters. Perspectives from, from Southeast, Southeast Asia. Asia. Hey, this is Arlene, and you are with me on Drian ASEAN. Today, we are going to interview a famous journalist in Turkey and all over the world. I'm talking about Mustafa Akyol. He has been writing in opinion pieces in New York Times, also in newspapers in Turkey. And today, he is with me right now to share about Islam and also about liberalism. First of all, I want to say welcome to Drian ASEAN. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. These two words, Islam and liberalism, it has very vast meaning. It's, it's a very heavy word as well. You know, it has different meaning to a lot of different people. So to break it down, how do you see liberalism exists within Islam? Well, again, as you said, these are words with heavy mm-hmm. uh, baggages sometimes, especially liberalism. And there are, uh, I'm sure, there are some Muslims who think liberalism as something against religion something that wants to you know make muslims go away and leave abandon their values and so on and so forth that is not what i mean by liberalism i define liberalism in a very classical limited sense in the sense that people should be able to live in the way they want and governments and societies should not coerce individuals mm-hmm. against their will Does this mean that, is this against Islam? No, it means that people should be able to live Islam in the way they understand it. There are different interpretations of Islam. People have different levels of religiosity. Some people are very religious. Some people are not that religious. That should be respected. So in other words, liberalism in Islam would be living the kind of life as what our modern society, which is based on democracy and freedom. Exactly, and uh, for me also, liberalism is, if you will, rooted right in the Quran, and for me it is expressed in the famous verse in the Surah Al-Baqarah, let there be no compulsion in religion, la ikraha fid din. That's a verse that many Muslims you know, know and they sometimes repeat, but also uh, many Muslims find ways to limit the freedom given in this verse. Mm-hmm. They, may, they say, oh no, no, that is only, there's no co- coercion only if you're not a Muslim. But if you enter Islam... So they always you are, put the disclaimer. They, they put a disclaimer into the worst <laughs> because the worst gives a big freedom. It says no compulsion in religion. Uh, and I think that's a very fundamental perspective. But don't you think the reason why some Muslim put disclaimer in certain vague words like freedom is to make a sense of what freedom means to society? Of course, we should talk about this. I mean, nobody advocates a society that people are free to commit crimes. We're not saying people should be able to go kill and steal. That should be freedom. Of course, crime in the sense of hurting somebody else should be illegal in any society. But when we're speaking of freedom, there comes other issues. For example, should people be forced to go to Juma prayers or... Should people be monitored by the state if they are fasting in Ramadan? Have an attendance book. (laughs) Have an attendance book? I say no, Mm -hmm. because if you do that, you are uh, not achieving a sincere, heartfelt religiosity. If you are forcing people to go to the mosque, people begin to go to the mosque not because they fear God. They go to the mosque because they fear the state or the social uh, uh, setting around them, the peer pressure. Mm-hmm. Religion should be based on the individual's willingness to worship God, and in we words, should nurture that. In other words, it has to be based on spirituality of the person. Exactly, exactly. Let me give, tell you a story. I mean, I've been to, uh, for example, Saudi Arabia many times for for the religious reasons and also for event like conferences. Every time I uh, been to Saudi Arabia, I got on the plane from Riyadh or or, you know, Jidda to Istanbul. And I realized that every woman enters the plane from Saudi Arabia with a niqab or a hijab uh, cover. Abaya. Abaya. Mm. Uh, when, they, when we land in Istanbul, some of them go out without them. And actually, I've seen very short mini skirts, you know, uh, worn by Saudi women, which showed to me that by imposing an understanding of religion on society by the authoritarian measures of the state, we are not achieving a heartfelt uh, generosity, a religiosity. We are actually creating a hypocritical society. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
religion should come from the heart. Religion should come from the individual's willingness to worship God. Mm-hmm. And of course, we can try to nurture that willingness. We can have education. We can have, um, you know, dawa. You know, Islamic organizations can try to reach out to society and try to do good in that sense. Uh, but if you start to force people, if you start to police people, you move from religion to a authoritarian political system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the fundamental problem in the so-called Islamic states in the world today. They're trying to uh, create religiosity. They're ra- rather creating, uh, I think, hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. Just publish a book. Tell me more about it. Well, my book is titled Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty. It was published in the U.S. in 2011. And then it got reprinted uh, in Turkish, in Turkey, in Indonesian, in Indonesia. And actually, it just got published in Malaysia. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, the title is, if I spell right, Islam Tampa Kextremisme. Oh, Islam Tampak Extremen. Yeah, so it's in Malay yeah. language. It's in Malay language, so it got published recently, and our listeners can find it in bookstores, I think, in Malaysia. In all the major bookstores yeah, in Malaysia. Yeah, in all the major bookstores. In it, I argue for uh, freedom within the Islamic tradition. And I go and look at Islamic schools of thought that we forgot today, which really defended a more... Uh, tolerant, diverse, rational, and liberal understanding way back in the Middle Ages. Uh, so, why by uh, in the book I also deal with these thorny issues, apostasy, blasphemy. Uh, how do we understand them today, and how Muslims will be uh, more actually true to the Quran when they understand these in a non-coercive way today? Mm-hmm. Brilliant. So you wrote a book with liberalism in mind. What actually you want to achieve in the book? What kind of well, message? Well, I mean, I told you my basic idea, this idea of coercive uh, interpretations of Islam. So in the book, I put the problem. Then I say, let's go to the Quran. Let's go to the prophetic example. Let's go to the fiqh, the, uh, the interpretation of Sharia. And let's see what are the approaches there. And uh, basically, one thing I emphasize is that actually there's nothing in the Quran that you can use to coerce religion. Uh, the Quran says, do your prayers, but it doesn't say there should be a religious police who it's actually checks these. So it's a disclaimer these. that adds more to what the actual meaning is. Is that the case? Uh, well, the disclaimers come because people read the Quran, but they, they are, there are other sources. Then there are hadiths, of course, there are important sources for Islam. But hadiths have been written two centuries after Prophet Muhammad, and uh, I think today we will have a more healthy approach to them if we compare them with the Quran. And in a hadith that clashes with the Quran cannot be, I think, accepted from a mm-hmm. uh, from an authentic a Muslim point of view. Then comes the interpretation of scholars, the the, the traditional schools of thought that, that have developed over time. And we respect those scholars, we should respect. But we live in a different context. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, one thing I explain in my book is that there is this ban on apostasy in Islam. Ridda, you know, in Arabic. Like, you can't leave Islam and choose another religion. Uh, th- th- this is not in the Quran. Again, there's nothing in the Quran, actually, which brings a ban like so that. So a person can go in and out of a religion... Uh, Islam or whatever religion they want to go in whenever Exactly, they wish that's to. what I think and well, my my thought is not important, <laughs> just in the but that's what the Quran says, I mean, let there be no compulsion in religion, in other words says the truth is from your Lord, let anyone who want to believe it, believe it, let anyone who want to disbelieve it, disbelieve it there's another verse in the Quran actually which speaks of people who believe and disbelieve and believe and again disbelieve, which shows that at the time of the Prophet Muhammad people could be Muslims and then maybe decide later and then, but Sh- one thing yeah. But there is a ban on uh, Ridda, which is changing religion in, in Islam and which is kept in some societies today. Well, in the book, I explained that what was meant by Ridda at that time was not changing your religion. It was joining the enemy. Mm-hmm. It was high treason, as we, we call today. So, so it had a different meaning in a certain context. So, so enemy in this context, in the Prophet Muhammad's context, is people who are overtly against Islam. Who were at war with Islam, who okay. had swords and coming to kill Muslims. I mean, so it's not, not just, just with their ideas, yeah, not, I mean, not just people critical of Islam, yeah. people who are trying to kill, exterminate the Muslims, mm-hmm. and who people who besieged. When they say the enemy, it's not just a bunch of people who say that I don't believe in Islam, or, you know, Islam is not the true source of 
whatever. I mean, this sort of opinion. Those are the people we will argue with intellectually. Okay. Uh, I mean, there are intellectual enemies mm. of Islam. Yes. Mm. I mean, there are people who say Islam is a horrible religion, mm. write books uh, who pump Islamophobia. There are people like that in the world. I personally discussed and debated with some of those people on the on the web or sometimes conferences. Uh, that's an intellectual challenge for us, for Muslims, and we should do a better job in terms of defending our faith with the pen, not with the sword. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're attacking us with the sword, of course we will defend ourselves. In that case, that becomes a military issue. Mm -hmm. But I think we should not try to uh, protect, uh, quote-unquote, Islam by uh, blinding us to ideas that are out there which are critical. If we don't learn those non-Islamic or anti-Islamic ideas, how we will be able to manage them? Mm -hmm. How will we be able to develop an intellectual narrative against them? Do you think conservatives have problem accepting your book? Since some, the conservatives, word in some conservatives will have a problem because mm -hmm. they think that if you give freedom to society, the society will go astray. Is the it so true? Do you agree in that statement? Maybe yes, to some extent, but... If you don't give freedom to society, you are creating this bubble that uh, you're saying, oh, our good Muslims should not know about different ideas and different lifestyles. When they get out of that bubble, and now they do because there's internet, there's a free world, there's travel and everywhere. Muslims becomes uh, become unequipped. If you protect a, a Muslim kid in a bubble, never teach him what atheism is and what's the arguments against atheism, one day that kid will uh, go to the internet and will go to atheist websites and he will be shocked. It will be better if he learns about these ideas and also the responses to that. So I think the conservatives want to protect Islamic values by closing our minds or closing our borders. But they have a good intention there. But I think the method they choose, which is authoritarianism, is not helping the intention. Also, once they start to coerce Islam in terms of practice, they're creating hypocrisy, as I said in the beginning. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll discuss further on this subject.